Almighty God, we thank you that you are a God who speaks through the pages of Scripture. And so we pray as we come to your word now that by your spirit, you would open our ears, you would soften our hearts, you would humble us before your word. Would you, by your spirit, work in our lives by this word? Would you reveal where we are not worshipping you, but are worshipping other things? Would you, in your grace and mercy, bring us to repentance, that we might turn back to you and rejoice in our Saviour, Jesus Christ? In his name we pray. Amen. Well, if you do have a a Bible with you, then uh, please make sure you've got it open at Jeremiah chapter 2, or pull it up on your your phone screen or uh, on your laptop. Make sure that you've got God's Word in front of you uh, as I preach. Well, the phone was ringing, so I picked it up. Good morning, Cornerstone Church. How can I help you? That's my best telephone voice. Hello, said the voice at the other end. My name's Patrick, and I'm calling from Alliance Energy. My heart sank. I'd like to speak to whoever manages your electricity supply, please. Now, I don't know what it is about Cornerstone's energy supply, but it is almost a weekly occurrence that we get a phone call from someone offering us a better deal. Or at least that's what they claim. Anyway, I responded as Spencer has trained us all in the office to respond. No, thank you. We're very happy with our current supplier. And I put the phone down. But it's a fact of life, isn't it? Whether it's our electricity supply, gas, water, broadband, mobile, car insurance, home insurance, travel insurance, well, maybe not travel insurance right at the moment. But we live in an age, don't we? Where we're encouraged to shop around, to find the best deal, always keep checking that you're getting the best service. And actually, I I don't think that's anything new. In fact, at the core of our chapter in Jeremiah today is a switch. A switch of water supply. Take a look at verse 13 again. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. You see, at the core of of ancient Israel's problems, at the very centre of why they were now faced with God's judgment, why Jeremiah had been tasked with delivering his message of impending exile, was that they had made a switch. They had been drinking from the fountain of delights, from the living water of the living God. But they had chosen now to switch, to find a a different supplier. And they had turned to cisterns, pits dug in the ground, often lined with clay to catch rainwater. But as we shall see, this was a disastrous and foolish switch. Far from getting a better deal, those systems were simply not up to the job. In place of a a cool, refreshing, life-giving spring, the people of Judah had instead settled for grubbing around in the muddy puddle at the bottom of a broken system, desperately trying to suck out what moisture they could in the heat of their desert climate. Well, of course, that's that's just a picture, an illustration to show how foolish this switch had been. The real switch was was much more serious and much more fundamental. God had, had spelled it out just a couple of verses earlier in the end of verse 11. 
my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. You see, the real issue here is not a switch of utility provider. It's a switch of God's. From Yahweh, the the true and living God of the Bible, to, well, as we'll see, to just about anything else. That is what this chapter, with all of its colorful imagery and vivid language, is about. That is why the the kingdom of Judah now faces invasion from the north and exile at the Lord's hand. And that is what we will be digging into throughout the rest of this sermon. Just before we go on, I, I want to say a little something about how those of us who are Christians come to this passage. About how we listen to the Lord in these, his words. Because you see, that there is a version of this sermon where I stand here and, and we work through all the ways in which our 21st century Western culture has abandoned the God of the Bible. All the ways in which the world out there runs after countless false gods, but won't give a second thought to the true and living God. And friends, all of that would be true. Our nation, our culture has indeed run headlong into sin and rebellion against Yahweh. But that sermon would be too easy to preach. It would be too comfortable to listen to. And it would not, I believe, be faithful to this passage of Scripture. Because we must realize who these words of God were first spoken to. We must realize that the the target audience for these accusations is, well, somewhat closer to home. Jeremiah, remember, was addressing the kingdom of Judah, what remained of the people of ancient Israel, God's chosen people. These were the people of Jerusalem, the people of the temple. People who no doubt did all the rituals, went to all the festivals. These were people who would identify as followers of Yahweh. And yet the Lord looks at their hearts and he sees that he is no longer on the throne there. He has been swapped, exchanged for all manner of false gods, replaced by things that are no God at all. And so as we hear these words today, if you would call yourself a Christian, if you would count yourself a follower of Yahweh, the God of the Bible, then feel the force of these words to us, the church, to those who claim Christ's name for themselves to those who have known his saving power and work in their life. And ask yourself, have we too performed a switch? Have we replaced the the living God with poor imitations? I should warn you that, that taking that perspective will make this passage a whole lot less comfortable for us. But it will make this a vital message that we simply cannot afford to ignore. Let's read again from verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I remember the devotion of your youth. How as a bride you loved me. And followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who devoured her were held guilty, and disaster overtook them, declares the Lord. This is the the honeymoon album. Ancient Israel enraptured with Yahweh, her saviour. 
He brought her up out of slavery in Egypt, guided her through the wilderness, and established her safe in the promised land. But how quickly all that was forgotten. Verse 4. Hear the word of the Lord, you descendants of Jacob, all you clans of Israel. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your ancestors find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and ravines, a land of drought and utter darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives? I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce. But you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. Here they were, in the land he had promised, a fertile and rich land. They had known the security of the days of the kings, the glory of King David, the majesty of King Solomon in all his finery. How good God had been to them. And how quickly they had forgotten it. Even their leaders, the next verse tell us, tells us, even their leaders went astray. And so now things have come to a head. Verse 9. Therefore, I bring charges against you, declares the Lord. And I will bring charges against your children's children. Cross over to the coast of Cyprus and look, send to Kedar and observe closely. See if there has ever been anything like this. Has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet they are not gods at all. But my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror declares the Lord. This is the language of the courts. The spark has gone from this once beautiful marriage. But this is not simply a, a drifting apart. This is not a no-fault divorce. No, the court papers are quite clear. The Lord God is bringing charges against his people Israel. They have actively, deliberately betrayed him. They have neglected the relationship. They have been unfaithful. They have left behind the love of their youth and have made a mockery of the covenant between them. They have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. And what follows is an astonishing array of evidence laid before the court. Jeremiah presents exhibit after exhibit, painting an ever more vivid and lurid picture of the betrayal that God's people have visited upon him. There's some fabulously rich picture language here. Verse 13, we've already read, God's people have settled for stagnant mud over living water. Verse 14, although he rescued them from slavery in Egypt, they have allowed themselves to become bound again to the great regional powers. Verse 18, now why go to Egypt to drink water from the Nile? Why go to Assyria to drink water from the Euphrates? They really will go anywhere to drink, anywhere except to him, the living God. They'll even go back to Egypt. And then from verse 24, quickfire illustrations. Long ago, you broke off your yoke and tore off your bonds. You said, I will not serve you. They've rejected their role as, as God's servants. Indeed, on every high hill and under every spreading tree, you lay down as a prostitute. But they've offered themselves to anyone else. 
I had planted you like a choice vine of sound and reliable stock. How then did you turn against me into a corrupt wild vine? God had provided for them, but they went their own way. Although you wash yourself with soap and use an abundance of cleansing powder, the stain of your guilt is still before me, declares the sovereign Lord. No amount of religious observance or pious rule keeping can remove from Judah the stain of their sin. They have given themselves over to other gods. They have rejected Yahweh. And so we come to possibly the most striking of these images. Partway through verse 23. You are a swift she-camel, running here and there. A wild donkey, accustomed to the desert, sniffing the wind in her craving. In her heat, who can restrain her? Any males that pursue her need not tire themselves. At mating time, they will find her. Judah, God says, is like a skittish wild animal, darting from place to place, like a wild donkey on heat, driven on by an insatiable desire for satisfaction. It's a lurid image. It's an offensive image, but it's an accurate image. Even the people themselves now admit it. Verse 25, it's no use, they say. I love foreign gods and I must go after them. This is why Judah now faces the same fate as the northern tribes of ancient Israel before her, judgment and exile. They have exchanged their God, the only true God, for powerless, worthless idols. The very gifts that God gave them, a land, crops, trees, stone, these have become the things they worship the things they live for. But does this really describe us too? Are we really to look at this picture of Iron Age idolatry and see parallels with our own behavior? Well, if you're a Christian listening to this, I wonder... Do you recognize where this chapter started? The honeymoon album. A time in your life when Jesus Christ was your all in all. Maybe you just come to faith or, or maybe it was a time when you decided to really go for it as a Christian. And for a time, life with Christ felt sweet. You really loved him. You wanted to to give yourself to him. That he had saved you from your sin felt real. It felt tangible. There was real heartfelt thankfulness and praise. Here was the one who had brought us out of opposition to God and brought us in to new life with him. Oh, what a joy it was to be part of the people of God. But friends, if you are anything like me, then that has not been your universal experience of the Christian life. How quickly, how easily other things begin to take God's place. How quickly we forget God's goodness to us. We acknowledge that that he saved us in Christ, but only in our heads, not so much in our hearts. Once real and passionate worship becomes mere formalism, going through the motions. 
and things which started out as good gifts from him, they become ultimate. They become the object of our desire instead of him. From one purchase to the next, from one relationship to the next, from one house extension to the next, from one job promotion to the next, there's always something else to go after, something else to pursue, darting here and there, looking for, striving for, craving satisfaction. Does it sound like a wild camel? Does it sound like a donkey on heat? And here's the real tragedy. It's not even a good switch. It doesn't give us a better deal. It doesn't give us what we're after. We don't find satisfaction and fulfillment. Verse 27. They say to wood, you are my father, and to stone, you gave me birth. They have turned their backs to me and not their faces. Yet when they are in trouble, they say, come and save us. Where then are the gods you made for yourselves? Let them come if they can save you when you are in trouble. But of course, these gods are are no gods at all. They're fakes, imitations, promising much, but lacking in power. A few months ago, I lay awake in bed. I never normally struggle to sleep. But this particular night, I was gripped by anxiety. It's not something I've known before this pandemic. But a few times since, I've I've found myself unable to settle. Mind racing, heart racing. No peace to be found. And do you know what I realized as I tossed and turned in bed that night? When faced with a global pandemic, when the future looks more uncertain than ever before in my lifetime, when it is made obvious that I am not really in control, very few of the things that I spend my time living for striving for, running after. Very few of them really brought me peace in that moment. My house, my possessions, my wealth, my health, my job, my reputation, even my wife and my children, all Good gifts from God, but all ultimately unable to save me. Even the NHS can't ultimately save me. There's no point calling on the the bricks and mortar around me or on the money in my bank account. Come, save us! No. In that moment, in truth, in every moment, there is only one on whose name we may call and be saved. We need Jesus Christ. Not just once to get in, but each and every day, in each and every moment. If we cannot see that in the shadow of God's right and just judgment, then we never will. What was the Lord doing in bringing judgment on Judah? Well, in part, he was calling them back, calling them to repentance and to renew their faith in him, calling them to enjoy life with the husband of their youth, calling them away from the the worthless idols they'd been running after, idols that were no use to them, and calling them back to the true and living God, 
the one who had saved them and who would go on saving them. What is the Lord doing in this time? Well, in part, he's calling us back. God's judgment becomes something we welcome, something we rejoice in, something sweet, because it calls us back home. Why would we drink from a broken cistern when we have known Jesus Christ, the living water? Why would we take on the unbearable burden that our idols place on us when we have known the light and easy yoke of the Lord Jesus? Why would we rebel and and go off to be a wild vine producing sour grapes when we have been grafted into the living vine, Jesus Christ, in whom we bear much fruit, Why would we try and and scrub ourselves clean with all our strivings and effort when we have known the cleansing flow of the blood of Jesus Christ? Why would we open ourselves up to the shame and degradation of idol after idol, using us for what it can get, leaving us broken and ashamed? when we have known the tender love of our dear and faithful husband. Friends, recognize the folly in exchanging the living God for worthless idols. And come back. Come back to him. Come back to your first love. For he is faithful, and he will have mercy upon those whom he loves. Let's pray. Almighty God, faithful covenant God, we come before you today in sorrow and in repentance. Recognizing that just like your people before us, we too are so prone to exchange the living God for worthless idols. Lord, in your mercy, by your spirit, reveal to us now where we are doing that in our lives and lead us to repentance. Lead us to come back. Turn us, Lord, away from useless, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And turn us once again to the living water of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.